Good afternoon. I'm Mary Weeks. I'm a past state president for the Business and Professional Women of Pennsylvania. We, along with several other organizations here today, we are here to discuss and bring to light legislation on equal pay, minimum wage. Representatives are here also from AAUW and the Women's Law Project. I would like now to introduce Amal Bass, who is the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Women's Law Project. Amal. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Amal Bass and I'm co-executive director and the director of policy and advocacy at the Women's Law Project, a nonprofit public interest organization that works to defend and advance the rights of women, girls, and LGBTQ people in Pennsylvania and beyond. Earlier this month, on March 12th, we recognized Equal Pay Day, which represents the day in the year that a woman must typically work to earn the same as the average man from the previous year. The date changes slightly from year to year, but it hasn't moved substantially in a long time, and that's because the gender-based wage gap remains a persistent problem. The Census Bureau data show that women working full-time year-round make an average of 84 cents for every dollar paid to men. It's 78 cents to the dollar when we include part-time workers and workers who aren't employed year-round. The pay gap is also more substantial when we take race into account, with black and brown women making far less. For every dollar paid to white men, black women are paid 69 cents, native women are paid 59 cents, and Latinas are paid 57 cents, pushing their equal pay days much farther into the year. Black women's equal pay day isn't until July 9th, Latina equal pay day isn't until October 3rd, and native women's equal pay day isn't until November 21st. Why is unequal pay so persistent? Why do we have to talk about it and draw attention to it year after year? We've had equal pay laws that make it illegal for employers to pay women less than men, and these laws have been on the books for six decades, over six decades. There has been progress since that time, but we have stalled. We must update these laws to better address the pernicious ways that gender and race-based stereotypes and structural biases continue to plague the workplace in 2024. Contributing factors to the pay gap include biases that undervalue the work women and people of color perform and that concentrate women and people of color in low-wage work. The impact of occupational segregation is significant but women do not make as much money as men, even when they are working within the same occupation. Another contributing factor is discrimination that pushes people out of the workforce because they are perceived as being able to get pregnant, or because they are pregnant, or because they care for children or other family members. This type of unpaid work at home is disproportionately performed by women. And there is a long history of employers viewing women with parenting and caretaking responsibilities as being less committed to work, less valuable in the workplace, and thus unworthy of support and promotion. These factors result in pay inequality. Women are paid less than men, mothers are paid less than fathers, and LGBTQ workers are also facing an income gap. The wage gap is a multifaceted problem that requires a multifaceted solution. We need legislation to tighten the enormous gaps in our state equal pay law, which in its current form is among the weakest in the nation. It protects very, very few people. We need legislation that would prohibit not only sex-based wage discrimination, but also race-based based and ethnicity-based wage discrimination. We need to make our state law apply to more Pennsylvanians by removing exceptions that currently make it apply to very few people. We need to change the standard from requiring equal pay for equal work, which sounds good, but is hard to apply in practice, to a standard that focuses on whether the work is comparable, to prevent employers from relying on immaterial differences in job descriptions to justify differences in pay. We need to address loopholes that allow employers to rely on sex-based, race-based, or ethnicity-based factors when setting pay. And we also need to increase pay transparency as well as prohibiting employers from relying on a job applicant's prior pay to set future pay. 
which really means that discrimination gets you know, pushed into the future and goes from job to job. There are bills in the Pennsylvania General Assembly that would amend our equal pay law to, in these very important ways, including House Bill 98, which you will hear more about later. This vital piece of legislation would make our state equal pay law more effective, getting us closer to closing the pay gap once and for all. And it must be done in conjunction with other legislative changes that also support the economic security of women and their families, like raising the minimum wage, as House Bill 1500 would do, and establishing paid family medical leave, as House Bill 181 would do. These types of policies support women and their families, making Pennsylvania stronger. It's high time it happened. Thank you for having me here today to talk about this important issue. Thank you, Amal. I would now like to introduce Representative Mary Louise Isaacson, who is a co-sponsor of House Bill 356, known as the Equal Pay Law, providing for pay ranges. Thank you, Mary Louise. Thank you, and thank you to everybody here who has traveled here and organized this event. Certainly, when we're talking about equal pay, we hear as legislators do get equal pay, but that's only because it's dictated and we had to get here and get ourselves elected to do it. And it was on the back of all the hard work of people who are here supporting, trying to move all women forward with regard to how they earn an income and how they support their families. My legislation is for the disclosure of pay ranges on job postings for positions offered. And the minimum compensation has to be there as well as the maximum. This system is to ensure equitable salaries for workers and further promote equal pay. Why is pay transparency so important? Because every worker deserves just and equal pay. For an individual to know their wages are equitable, they need to be able to be apprised of the pay range for the job they seek. And if this information is kept secret, that is how workers are exploited. Salaries and pay secrecy stops us from leveling the playing field, especially for women and people of color who are more likely to literally be shortchanged at the pay negotiations. Requiring transparency also encourages employers to evaluate their pay practices. Pay rage transparency laws can be meaningful steps towards dismantling the racist and sexist wage gap that robs women of their livelihood. Many women are already reaping these benefits as other states have stepped up and it's time for Pennsylvania to come forward and rem remedy this pay discrimination that takes place. So let us join with the other states that have done this and help all of us stand together to push forward these policies that we are proposing to make sure that there is equitable pay for all women in here in Pennsylvania. Thank you. We are also honored. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's OK. I'm a little shorter than you. Um, we are also honored to have three co-sponsors with us today of House Bill 98 on equal pay. So I would like to first call on Representative Donna Bullock. Thank you. I'm with you there, Mary. The, Representative Isaacson brought that up a little too high for us. Good afternoon. I'd like to just share a few uh, words about House Bill 98. I'm honored to be co-sponsoring this bill along with my colleagues, Representative Schusterman and Representative O'Mara. This bill will address a number, the, a number of the issues that Amal mentioned in her opening remarks. Pay transparency, addressing salary history so that we don't perpetuate that discrimination and that pay inequity from previous jobs, as well as creating a merit system that isn't influenced by factors like race, gender, age, and other, um, other qualifications that should not be considered. A merit system that also makes sure that we don't deduct years or months from somebody because they took family leave um, and now they lost their seniority in that system. 
this is what House Bill 98 does, but it makes me think a lot about the fact that pay equity isn't just about um, one particular profession, one particular industry. What we see when we look at the numbers, regardless of the industry, regardless of the profession, from the doctor to the care, child care worker, these pay inequities exist. One of the things we know is that unions make a difference. When a union is in place, less likely to have pay inequities. What we also know is that even in professions in which women are seen as the, in society as, uh, or has the numbers of, this is a woman's profession, like teaching or nursing or being a child care worker, we still have those pay inequities. So I'm honored to be joined today by the AAUW, our university woman, our business and professional woman. But we know that this is throughout industries. We get the pleasure of hearing on social media and on TikTok about the work that our, U our U.S. soccer team, women's soccer team, has done. And I, I appreciate that work. I also remember a story a few years ago um, from the rapper Cardi B, where she was going and performing at clubs and realized that the male rappers were getting paid more than she was when she was the top ticket on the, on the bill. She was the reason why folks was coming to the club. And she said, you know what, fellas? I'm not performing anymore unless I get paid top dollar because everybody in this club is in here to see me. This is unreal that is happening in even those settings. And so while I'm here with my colleagues, and I'm not sure how many of us are Cardi B fans, but I'm going to go just a little back and say, you know, we have a little, we have more work to do. I'm excited that our chairman in the Labor and Industry Committee will be reviewing this bill this week in his committee. But in the words of Little Kim, who goes a little further back than Cardi B, I'm going to throw shade if I can't get paid. All right. Thank you, Donna. Yeah, a little bit. Just a little bit of, just a little bit of skills there. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Representative Melissa Schusterman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I had, to, I had to bring it back up. <laughs> I'm Representative Melissa Schusterman from Chester County, and let me tell you, I am fired up about this. My background is in television and film, where I was underpaid. I did not receive equal pay, and it was so bad that I eventually started my own company, so I knew how much I got paid. But back to this fabulous bill, HB 98. I kind of want to put it out there for my male colleagues and my male constituents. Imagine if you went to the grocery store and saw different prices for men and women. People would be outraged. What if there were different prices at the gas pump? We have to end this practice of paying women less for the same job with especially women who have the same level of education and the same number of hours worked. This is not acceptable and it's time we do something about it. And let me tell you, the ladies behind me are tired of coming here and standing on the steps. But I also want to break it down. What does this mean, not to have equal pay? The disparity in pay leads to less income for women to support their families. Higher rates of poverty, lower financial earnings over a lifetime, and less money saved for retirement, and that means women are working longer and longer. Now, take a look at this stat. If all women were given equal pay for equal work, we could reduce the number of working women and single mothers living in poverty by half. We are talking about billions of lost wages. Creating equal pay also means an additional $482 billion would be added to the U.S. economy. That is common sense win for everyone, but most importantly, for women and their families. I want to bring it back to $482 billion infused in our economy if women actually got paid equally. So equally, equal pay is about valuing women, and obviously, it's long overdue. Thank you. Bring it back down. 
I would now like to introduce Representative Jennifer O'Mara. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. You have heard already from my colleagues, Representative Melissa Schusterman and Chairwoman Donna Bullock, on why House Bill 98 is so important. And I want to thank both of them for their leadership and commitment to equal pay. I have remarks prepared, but honestly, they've mostly been repeated by everyone else. So I instead want to talk to you about why I am motivated to work on equal pay. I missed a call earlier in, prep in preparing for this from my daughter. And I'm really excited that my daughter knows when I go to work that I do get paid equally because the Constitution requires it. I'm motivated to do this because of my mom. My mom was a stay-at-home mom and lost my, her husband, my father, when I was 13 and she was just 36 years old. She hadn't worked in 15 years and suddenly had to be the primary caregiver for three kids under the age of 13. She struggled to find a job that gave her a living wage and to be able to provide for us. She couldn't afford childcare. I was her childcare, starting at 13 and four months. She couldn't afford sometimes to cook. We had to go eat dinner at our grandmom's house because we didn't have any food in the cabinet. We had to rely on free lunches. The difference that my mom had to deal with, I didn't realize this. She had to wait until August 7th for moms to earn the same that dads do in the workplace. On average, a woman makes $10,000 less a year than a man does doing comparable work. Imagine what that $10,000 would have done for my mom and for our family. And she is not alone. We stand here today on the shoulders of women that have fought to be in the workplace in the same way that men have. And it's frankly still not there. For my first year, honestly, my first term as legislator, I was asked whose secretary or intern I was and stopped by security when trying to enter the floor, even when walking on with my male colleagues. When we pay women equally, we're not just going to make sure they're making the right amount of money. We're going to change the culture that exists in our society that puts men above women everywhere in society that's still happening. And so I want to thank all of you that have been fighting this fight for longer than we have and that are still showing up. The work is unfinished. We're taking a big step tomorrow in the right direction with House Bill 98. And I also want to thank Chairman Jason Dawkins from Philadelphia for recognizing the urgency of this. But we can't stop with one bill. And thank you all for recognizing that when we pay women equally, we're going to lift up everyone in our society. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let you know that there is one other House bill concerning minimum wage. It's House Bill number 1500, and Representative Jason Dawkins is a co-sponsor of that, um, in addition to 98 and 356. I would now like to introduce Ann Paley, who is a past state president of the AAUW, to speak on equal pay. Oh, there you are. We sneak up on you. You did. Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Paley, and AAUW um, has been advocating for women and girls across the country in our national organization since 1881. Um, and I'm with AAUW Pennsylvania, but then also a branch um, here in Carlisle, and we're celebrating our 100th anniversary later this year. And we have um, boldly gone and every, throughout every year advocating for women and girls. That has not changed. Um, representing AEW Pennsylvania, I'm honored to be here with these um, partners in crime, if you will, and the legislators who have put forth bills that really do make a difference for women and girls in Pennsylvania. March 12th, as Amal said, was Equal Pay Day, which marked how far into 2024 
some women had to work full time um, to equal what a man worked in all of 2023. Regrettably, women of color, women of um, minority women are paid even less than that and work much longer into the following year to earn what a man had earned in, in the previous year. So here on March 26th, um, you are, are now just earning what you have started in what, earning for 2024. And women shouldn't need an extra month or longer to be able to earn the same money as a man. Women and their families, especially women of color um, and racial and gender inequity, we stand to lose not only money every year, but money in earning our retirement because Social Security contributions are less, 401k contributions are less. So we become poorer in retirement just as we were poorer in, in working. And regrettably, that means there's still a lot to do and so since we're standing in this beautiful rotunda, instead of talking about national work, I want to talk about Pennsylvania. We have five things in our bills that we're looking for. Yes, Pennsylvania has a law back in 1959, and then it was amended in 1967. And first, we want to address something from that amendment. We want to cover all employees. That amendment in 1967 made an exception for people who are covered under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is a federal law. And it said if you're covered by that federal law, you don't have equal pay protection. That's what's happening today. So let me tell you the jobs that are not covered by Fair Labor Standards Act and see if you or any of your friends, neighbors, relatives have ever had one of these jobs. Babysitters on a casual basis, companions for the elderly, farm workers on small farms, those employed by certain seasonal and recreational establishments, federal cr criminal investigators, delivery, newspaper delivery people, newspaper employees of limited circulation newspapers, seamen on other than American vessels, and switchboard operators. If you are in one of those jobs, you are covered by, L by Pennsylvania's equal pay laws. The rest of us are not. So we also want comparable worth. As it's been mentioned here, talking about we, we want jobs to be evaluated, graded, if you will, on substantially similar skill, responsibility, and performed in similar working conditions. And I, in the early 90s, put a comparable worth um, compensation system into a company that I worked for, was VP of HR, and this was relatively new at that point. It's no longer a new concept. Grading, evaluating jobs on the impact in the organization is what makes and allows for comparable worth. And you know, I have a friend who here in Pennsylvania was the food service director in a school district, and she had more employees, and a bigger budget, but earned less than the maintenance director with fewer employees and a smaller budget. Why? Because food service directors are usually women. And there's the gender equity issue um, f playing out, and it still is not fixed. Third, we want um, employees to be protected um, against retaliation there can, of, of being of speaking out about their salaries and sharing their salaries with others. And also, we want employers not to ask salary history. Pay transparency is important, and as was said before, if you don't have transparency and you can't talk about it in the workplace, then you don't trust that you're being fared, paid fairly. Asking salary history penalizes women for all of the bad compensation practices of their previous employers. It's a meaningless number. We want to take a break, and excuse me, and women who take a break from working for money are penalized. When jobs and candidates are evaluated on skills and impact, this is less likely to happen. In 2018, we were happy to be next to Governor Wolf as he signed the um, 
uh, 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 an executive order to prevent the asking of job applicants what their previous pay was and to base salary on job responsibilities, position pay range, and the applicant's pay knowledge and skills and also to post the pay range clearly in job postings. About half of the states have banned the asking of salary history, but not Pennsylvania. The cities of, Pencil of excuse me, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh have also banned um, asking of salary histories. But I ask, do we have to go state to state, excuse me, city to city, borough to borough, township to township to get that equal pay possibility for all women in Pennsylvania? No. Thanks to the Senate, the representatives here, we are going to be changing that in both of the bills that have been talked about today. And finally, as Amal said, we need to close the loopholes um, that provide penalties for um, employers and establish long legal, long legal procedure, strong legal procedures and remedies. Before I go, I want to say a quick word about living wage, because we haven't talked about that yet today, but that also impacts women, um, because 60% of the workers um, are, would benefit from a raise in minimum wage, because 60% of the minimum wage workers are women. We applaud any legislation that goes beyond only considering the federal measure of poverty, but takes into consideration the costs of child care and health care. And actually, legislation to review, and I ask legislators to review United Way's ALICE report, the Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed, because it describes what is necessary for a worker to enter and stay in the workplace by county and township and bureau, borough. So it's not a one-size-fits-all in Pennsylvania. We have to get creative and figure out how to help women in all of these places. So I encourage you to look at the bills that you've heard about today. Contact your state legislator. If you have a state legislator on the House Labor and Relations Committee, call them and tell them how you want them to pay attention to this tomorrow when they're looking at it. And Together, we will get equal pay and a living wage for all Pennsylvania employees. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to leave you with one final message. Oh, you ask me? Sure. I'm sorry. That's okay. This is Representative Abigail Sells. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Here, have a sign. Thank you. <laughs> Introduce yourself so they know. No problem. That's okay. You don't have to ask somebody who's an elected official twice if they want to speak at something, so it's all right. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Abigail Salisbury. I'm a representative for the 34th District from Allegheny County. Um, you know, I was listening to Representative O'Mara talk earlier about how um, she came from a household where her mother had to keep things going. I had a very similar experience. My father passed away when I was 13, and my mother was an accountant, and she always told me that you know, she, she would tell me certain things about what would go on in her workplace, things that she was told. Um, she was the director of finance at her position and she would be given gifts for what was then called Secretary's Day because it was assumed that she must be a secretary because she was a woman. She would come home and I would say, did you raise heck uh, with, uh, with the people who did that? And she said, no, you can't, you can't. So that was the 80s and 90s. Fortunately, we live in 2024. Um, well, at least in, in most places we're living in 2024. Some places want us to live in 1824. <laughs> but uh, I think nowadays, I think nowadays we have to keep in mind still that some people can't speak up. So those of us who have the opportunity to do so by virtue of being 
placed in one of these elected positions have an obligation to speak up for people like my mom who would maybe come home and say, you can't say anything or you'll lose your job if you feel like you're being discriminated against as a woman. Um, if you, you know, don't make a fuss because they'll get rid of you, that sort of thing. And, you know, sadly, that was true back then. And it's still true for some people today because they're still discriminated against um, and people are terminated all of the time for gender reasons. People are discriminated against in pay for gender reasons. We haven't fixed everything today just by virtue of moving forward in time. We have to make sure that we legislate to provide an opportunity for people to recover uh, damages if they are discriminated against. So I think it's very important that we support the legislation that's been discussed today. And it's very important that in our day-to-day -day lives, we support the uh, women who may be experiencing these issues even today. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. And thank you for your support thank also. You. I, we appreciate it. So, <laughs> never knew I was so short until I, anyway, um, one final word. On behalf of the business and professional women of Pennsylvania, as well as AAUW, and the legislators that are supporting these bills for equal pay, I want to commend all of you for your dedication to this issue. It's been way too long that we've been standing here doing equal pay rallies at the Capitol, and it's time to have some legislation go through. We're not asking for the sky. What we're asking for is equal pay for equal work. Thank you.